Welcome to our program tonight. I'm Doris Wise Montrose, President of Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. Our speakers tonight are, in order of their appearance, Professor Avi Bell, who holds multiple degrees from Harvard and the University of Chicago, clerked for the Supreme Court of Israel, and has taught courses on the laws of war and the legal aspects of the Arab-Israeli conflict. He is a professor at Bar Ilan University Faculty of Law as well as the University of San Diego Law School. J.J. Serbeck is a Swiss educated attorney who worked for 16 years for the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, which many have called the guardian of the Geneva Conventions. He has lectured and taught widely on the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols, also called international humanitarian law. He is currently executive director of TEAM, Training and Education about the Middle East, a nonprofit organization that is based in San Diego. Rick Richman is, from right here in LA, a graduate of Harvard College and NYU Law School. His articles have appeared in American Thinker, Commentary, The Jewish Journal of Greater Los Angeles, The Jewish Press, Pajamas Media, and The New York Sun. He blogs at Contentions and edits Jewish Current Issues. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce Jennifer Dyer. <laughs> Jennifer Dyer, who writes under the, the name J.E. Dyer, is a retired U.S. Naval Intelligence Officer who served around the world afloat and ashore from 1983 to 2004. Her last operations in the Navy were Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom in 2003, and she retired at the rank of commander. She lives now in the Inland Empire of Southern California, where she writes for various blogs and is preparing a book on the Cold War. Because of her background and the topics about which she writes extensively, she and I are working on a related symposium about the military and international law. Samples of her work are included in your handout. The format of tonight's panel discussion will be a little different than usual in order to elicit as much exchange among our panelists as possible. Each speaker will give an individual presentation and afterwards they will have the opportunity to question and answer one another. Having been privy to discussions among these gentlemen's, gentlemen in the planning of this event, I know you will find it as fascinating and informative as I did. If time allows, we will take questions from the audience at the end. The starting point for tonight's discussion is what Daniel Friedman calls the world's deadly obsession about with Israel. He writes, the simple solution for peace in the Middle East may be for Israel to change its name to Norway. Israel's diplomats discovered this trick in 1952 when an Israeli initiative at the UN for a ceasefire in Korea, put forward by Representative Abba Ibn, encountered serious opposition only to pass easily once Norway replaced Israel as the sponsor. These experiences led Ibn to later quip, if Algeria introduced a resolution declaring that the earth was flat and that Israel had flattened it, it would pass by a vote of 164 to 13 with 26 abstentions. <laughs> Israel is treated differently than other nations and the first casualty is Israel's citizens as its government is often pressured into taking actions contrary to its needs. Finding that balance between the needs of the citizens of Israel and the needs of her government, between security and, and internal pressure, international pressure, is the subject of our conversation tonight as we explore what is legal, what is just, what is possible, and what the probabilities are. Goldstone, international law, and the coming crisis in September. If you will kindly turn off your cell phones and other electronic devices, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Avi Bell. Thank you very much. Um, am I speaking close enough to this? Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to try to keep my comments brief. Um, I want to talk to you about the Goldstone Report, what it is, why it's important, what it is that recently led to a half retraction of the report, um, and what lessons we can draw from this entire episode. Um, if you don't know, 
The Goldstone Report is a report that was produced by a mission of a, a fact-finding mission appointed by the UN Human Rights Council. Um, it was headed by Judge Richard Goldstone of South Africa, um, hence the name. Uh, the, others, uh, the other members are fairly anonymous to most of the world. Um, Richard Goldstone was basically the face of this. Uh, I think that uh, when the report was presented, uh, Richard Goldstone held a press conference. It was the first time in the history of the UN Human Rights Council where a fact-finding mission was presented by a press conference. Uh, Goldstone took a, a number of efforts to pitch uh, the merits of his report to the world. Um, and um, I, it probably was necessary to do so because the merits of the report are quite hard to find. Uh, it uh, came in originally at 575 pages. Um, I think the quip was that it ensured by its length that no one would ever read it. Um, there was a, 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 it was difficult to avoid um, uh, criticizing the numerous flaws. The problem was to be able to fit these uh, uh, criticisms into some manageable uh, format. There's a, a think tank in, uh, in London, uh, the Chatham House. Uh, they had a two-day conference just on the procedural failings of the report. Um, there's a report that uh, came out afterwards on their criticisms. Um, they're all, in, in my opinion, every single one of these criticisms is well-based and doesn't even begin to touch the, uh, the flaws of the report. Here they were, it's biased and prejudiced, uh, with little analysis, hardly any references, aggressively biased, violated General Assembly rules on fact-finding, pre-selected witnesses by Hamas, uh, incidents were selected for political effect, uh, dismissively uh, uh, um, rejected Israel's extensive system of investigations. Now, it's, after it did all these things, um, there are, so many uh, uh, substantive flaws that I can't possibly go into them in the, uh, the short time that's available to me. So I'm just going to pick out a few and talk about them. I think they're also useful in order to draw out the lessons that we're going to draw from uh, this entire episode at the end of it. So let me just talk to you about um, uh, uh, two legal issues that came up in the report, among many. Um, and then we can talk about uh, uh, what happened with them. Right, so here's, here's number one, um, international law of terrorism. Now, if you read the Goldstone Report, you wouldn't know this, uh, such a thing exists. Um, but there is such a thing. Right? So the, um, the uh, uh, standard uh, cliche is that there is no definition of terrorism under international law, that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, um, that there's nothing that international law has to say about terrorism. Well, that, that happens to be pure nonsense, pure bunk, right? Here, here you have uh, a fairly popular treaty. What do I mean fairly popular? I think there are 170 something states that are party to this treaty, the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombings. Um, it has a definition of what constitutes acts of terrorism that are covered by the treaty. Um, there are acts that cause uh, or intended to cause death or persons not taking part in, in warfare. Um, where the purpose is uh, to intimidate a population or compel a government or an organization to do or not do a thing, or if it's any one of these acts that's listed in a whole bunch of other anti-terrorism treaties, uh, such as hijackings, uh, 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 taking hostages, um, unlawful acts of violence at airports, etc. Right? A whole bunch of uh, uh, treaties you have on terrorism. Who is a terrorist? Well, it's not only someone who carries out such an attack, but it's also those who organize or direct others um, or cooperate and otherwise uh, contribute to the commission of these offenses when one knows that that's what's going to be done. Right? There's a wide variety of people that are terrorists under this treaty. Um, there is no freedom fighter excuse under this treaty, right? Um, they are under no circumstances justifiable by considerations of a political, philosophical, ideological, racial, ethnic, religious, or other similar nature. Um, and there are legal duties that attach to this. A, s a state that's a party to this treaty has the duty to punish the offenses of terrorism. Okay? Now, um, it's not the only one out there. There's this uh, treaty, the International Convention of Suppression of Terrorist Bombings. Um, and perhaps most importantly, there's a Security Council resolution that was adopted uh, shortly after 9-11. Um, 
by Chapter 7 of the uh, 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 UN Charter, which means it is legally binding on all state members of the UN, that is basically all states in the world. And uh, among other things, it requires that all states refrain from providing any form of support, active or passive, to entities or persons involved in terrorist acts. Okay, that's a fairly unambiguous legal duty. Okay. Now, um, uh, the Goldstone Report concerned the Gaza War in 2009 between Israel and Hamas. Um, what is Hamas? Well, I, I'm going to guess that with it, this audience I don't have to give chapter and verse of why it is that Hamas is a terrorist organization. Um, and I have to guess that when you see comments like this on Hamas TV um, from shortly before the war, the, none of this will not surprise you that uh, comments like this are made about the blessing of the annihilation of Jews. Now, um, what is the number of times that the Goldstone Report deals with the uh, international law concerning terrorism? It never does. It's not important, right? Um, does it refer to Hamas as a terrorist group? No, not a single time. Um, do, how many times does it reach the conclusion that Hamas committed an act of terrorism? Never. Ne does it ever mention even this minor important fact that Hamas seeks to destroy Israel. Now the, Go the, the, uh, the Goldstone Report has a 20 page 40 year background to the Gaza conflict so that all readers will understand what it is that led to the conflict. Somehow or another it never managed to mention that part of the background to this conflict is that Hamas seeks to destroy the state of Israel. Um, nor does it mention any of this lovely stuff that you'll find, such as the blessing of uh, the annihilation of Jews in Palestine, or you can all find all sorts of wonderful things if you ever read the Hamas Charter about, um, about uh, um, the perfidy of the Jews, their control of the world, their being behind every war that's ever existed, and the best part is the secret organizations that they use to do it, such as the Freemasons. Now, there is stuff about Hamas and, uh, in, in the Goldstone Report. This is the kind of uh, thing that appears in the Goldstone Report. So it doesn't talk about the international legal duty to refrain from providing even passive support to Hamas. No, it says the opposite, right? Israel imposing economic sanctions on Gaza it somehow or another constitutes an unlawful form of collective punishment, according to the Goldstone Report. And even better, refusing to provide uh, uh, support to Hamas, um, arresting members of Hamas, or refusing to provide them jobs is an uh, infringement of their protected legal rights to political association and free speech. You know, you can't prevent Hamas from organizing in order to carry out its blessed annihilation of the Jews in Palestine. All right, so that's uh, legal issue number one. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, legal issue number two. Um, it's something called civilian shielding. Right? What is civilian shielding? Civilian shielding is basically directing the movement or holding, placing civilians in a place in order to use them to shield your own uh, position. Right? To, to use them to prevent the other side from firing at you. It's, uh, there's a related uh, 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 um, uh, prohibition. It's called perfidy. Right? Uh, the act of perfidy is feigning of protected status, status among other things. Excuse me. Where'd the... Pardon? Um, it's the feigning of protected status, such as, for example, by using uh, signs of the Red Cross. Um, in order not to be attacked. Okay, so does, did Hamas engage in this sort of thing? There are numerous reports. Here's just, for example, one. Right? Um, Hamas set up headquarters in Shifa Hospital in, uh, in Gaza. It's the largest hospital in Gaza. 